Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of Bearish or Bullish. I'm Julie Alexandria here with a bearded JC Peretz. JC, you know, the markets happen to be a mess, but I didn't know that that extended to your facial hair. Well, uh, market has been a mess, so I got the hell out of here. I went to the beach. Like, you know, listen, there's a time to be buying stocks aggressively and uptrends, and there's times to be shorting stocks aggressively and downtrends when volatility is up, and there are times to go fishing. But like, I'm not really a fisherman. I'm more of a, let's just go to the beach and drink some beers. Or in my case, I was drinking champagne, uh, you know, and then I don't have to shave or anything. I'm at the beach. You know, I got a little too much sun. It's wonderful. It's all right. You, you look good. You look good. If it's any indicator that hopefully the market's in an uptrend, you're, you're doing well. Okay, let's kick it off. I want to talk top five sectors for the third quarter. I'm going to give you some choices and you tell me which one excites you the most. Which one are you most bullish on? Here we go. Semiconductors, clean energy, software, value, and metals, and crypto. Wow. So, listen, I think that any sector, you know, where money's going to rotate into next currently, I think is a really, really hard question. Um, I like how you broke it into certain uh, industry groups and things like that. You know, I honestly, I, I think it's tough. Um, you know, metals are getting hit with a stronger dollar. Uh, the fact that the dollar has been bouncing, I think, is reflective of sort of a messy market. You know, had some volatility last week. You know, so it's. I think that this is a really difficult market to jump on a trend because of the lack of trends, which is why I was at the beach. So for me, usually, I probably have a pretty good answer. Uh, and, I, and usually knowing me, a pretty confident answer whether it ends up being right or wrong. Like I usually did the work and I'm like, yeah, you got to buy these, you know, but right now it, I think it's really hard. Like for me, I like cash. I like a lot of cash. I'd rather wait for resolution. So instead of like being like, all right, this is going to be the best industry group for this particular quarter, right? I'd rather be like, let the market tell us which one breaks out. So you mentioned solar you know, short term, we can have a bounce, but bigger picture, it's stuck below overhead supply. Things like software uh, have been consolidating in a way that could potentially break out and we resume the uptrend that we've been in, but we're still in that sideways mess. So it's hard to do that. In terms of value, they're really getting hit now. We've talked about it right here on the show and, and on the blog, of course, financials, industrials, transportation, a lot of these value areas hit our upside objectives. But I will tell you, so what I'll do is I'm going to lean on value. I'm going to lean on energy because of the relentless strength in crude oil. As we're recording this, crude oil is still hanging in there almost to our target. You know, we haven't seen that participation out of energy, but we've certainly seen some relative strength. So if you're going to put a gun to my head, I say value. But within value, I think energy. And if the XLE breaks out above 55, XLE above 55, which is the energy sector, Forget the rest of value. Value might do well, but energy is probably where we want to be if XLE is above 55. How about that for not answering your question? Uh, yeah, that was a very safe bet. But you did mention cash. I've read a lot of your blog posts talking about your position when it comes to cash, especially in messy markets. But is that your sort of defensive analysis? Like, is that, and for how long are you going to be so bullish on cash? Whenever in doubt, get smaller, right? That's what I was told when I was younger. It was instilled in my head and I wouldn't listen, Julie. I'd be like, no, 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 I'm going to trade this market. I got this, I got this. And I would get chopped up. So because of that, it's almost like I have post-traumatic stress disorder of getting chopped up in messy markets and giving back a lot of the gains that I had prior to those messy markets. And yeah. I had a habit when I was younger of thinking that the current market environment that we're, current, that we're in is the same one as the one we were a year ago or six months ago. And I, I had a hard time adapting to new environments. And because of that, I have, I, I have like, I guess, like a, an uncanny obsession with first identifying what type of market environment we're in and then deciding which tools and strategies to take advantage of that, in, of that environment. And because of my misfortunes, uh, prior misfortunes in messy markets, I have learned the hard way that it's best to just have a lot of cash and go to the beach or go skiing, depending on what time of the year it is, or go to Europe with your family or whatever it is. And these are lessons, Julie, 
you got to learn them the hard way. And I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart, I learned them the hard way. Fortunately, I had a lot less money in that in those instances, which is the idea. You want to learn your lessons early. And this one is whenever in doubt, get smaller. Uh, there's nothing wrong with cash. I hear nobody, nobody complaining that they've been in too much cash this year. Uh, it's actually the opposite. Everybody keeps telling me how they're getting chopped up and giving back a lot of the gains that they had over the prior year. Um, and that shouldn't be a surprise at all uh, because that's what happens in choppy markets. I know that because I've gotten chopped up in markets like this. <laughs> to that point, I would have to agree with you. I have some element of PTSD as well when it comes to investing because I booked my first job with your good buddy, our good buddy, Howard Lindzen, in the at the end of 2007, going into 2008, and he urged me, get into the market, get into the market, and then all of a sudden, 2008 happens, and I was so scared, and I thought, thank goodness I didn't because now I have cash. And here we are. So I totally get that. I will give you a pass. Let's move on. Our next topic, consumer stocks and regional banks losing some steam. You talk about them breaking down. Bearish or bullish? Listen, the regional banks sort of near the lower end of this range makes them vulnerable. Um, and same thing with consumer discretionaries. But I, I would pay particular attention to regional banks. If they break down here, that's a big indicator. One of the biggest reasons why we're so bearish at the end of January, early February of 2020, well before any COVID crash, was because regional banks were breaking down to all-time relative lows. That just wasn't something that was likely to happen in an environment that financials are breaking out of monster bases, right? It's actually indicative of a whipsaw, which is precisely what occurred, and that wound up being a great short for us. Bonds ripped. Fantastic. Now, moving forward, is this like that? I don't necessarily think it's that dramatic, but if we do break down here on, on a both an absolute and relative basis, I have to believe stocks in general are under pressure. Not to mention if regional banks are falling, there's probably an interest rate story there as well, which means that bonds are rallying. And if bonds, treasury bonds are ripping, what are stocks in general most likely doing? They're probably not doing well. So there are a lot of implications with what happens in regional banks. So I, I point to last week's lows, you know, if they could dig in and hold those lows and we remain in a choppy range versus a top, I think that would be constructive for stocks. If we start breaking last week's lows, uh, I think it's going to be a big, big problem. And it probably points to being in heavy cash longer. Which can't be a bad thing. You mentioned before. Not if you're in cash. It's a bad thing if you're, you know, super long. But I think, by the way, Julie, I think there will be a time to get super long again, like there was last year, right? But that just, that time hasn't been since, really since March when we confirmed, or really in, since February, if you really timed it right, which we didn't. We were a few weeks late. But, you know, since March, I mean, we've been pounding the table on cash. And that has been a, a wise choice. I wish I wasn't even more cash, actually. But that was all due in part to the messy market, which has been going on for so long. At this point, looking back, could you have predicted that it would have been this messy for this long? Right. So that was the risk. At the time, we knew we didn't want to be long. We also didn't know how bad it was going to get, right? All we knew that it was either going to be a range-bound market or stocks were going to fall. In either one of those instances, we didn't want to be long stocks, obviously. We, you know, for the most part, like there was some value that continued towards the end of that particular cycle that we did like, like industrials and financials, but then even those targets were hit in April, right? So for the most part, since February, it's been a range-bound market. We didn't know how long it's gonna take. I still don't know how long it's gonna take. My suspicion is we're ultimately gonna resolve higher and we could be aggressively buying stocks and I'll be clean shaved and not going on vacation all the time because I'm gonna be real busy taking care of business here. Uh, but in the meantime, I don't see any rush whatsoever you know, the fact that bonds are getting a bid, commodities are coming off. We continue to see not just fewer new highs in stocks, but now we're getting an expansion in new lows in stocks. That's something new. So things aren't getting better. They're just getting worse, which points to messy for longer. I'll tell you what, if regional banks can step in here and hold those levels, I think that would be one for the bulls, which would suggest messy, messy for not that much longer. Well... Moving on, Shohei Otani has committed to the Home Run Derby. He's the first player to do so. When it comes to two-way players, what do you think, bearish or bullish? Oh, he is the man. 
I remember I didn't know about this guy. I was in Guam like in 2016, 2017. And like this Japanese guy is like telling me about him. And I'm like, yeah, he's like serving me sushi. It was like one o'clock and I'm in Guam having lunch by myself talking to this like, you know, baseball fan in Guam. And he's like telling me about this. And I was like, all right, I'll look him up. And I look him up. I'm like, wow, this guy's supposed to be a stud. Then there were rumors of the Yankees getting him. Ultimately, he ended up going out to out west of the Angels. And um, man, what a stud. I saw a stat the other day and it was like, you know, home run, home, you know, like day after day, like Tuesday home run, Wednesday home run, Thursday, two home runs. Friday, you know, six innings pitched, five Ks, and the win. Then the next day, one home run. The next day, one home It was like, what a stud. <laughs> Literally, watching him play is like watching the home run derby anytime he plays. So we're excited to see him for sure. Okay, the best-selling wine brand in America happens to be Franzia, if you basically measure that by volume. They are getting into the better for you wine trend. New flavors include a peach Moscato, a tropical Pinot Grigio, and a strawberry rose. Bearish or bullish? I could not be more bearish of the juice. Uh, I would be bullish of the company because they'll probably sell that and people will probably buy it and drink it, uh, which will probably help the Advil business uh, <laughs> with all that sugar is going to kill you and you're going to need all that. So like the economy wins and the pharmaceuticals, everybody wins there, but the consumer loses hard. I'd stay away from all that stuff. Like if you understand the way wine is made, like these two buck chuck stuff, like that's cool and everything, but like the stuff that's in there um, and just in general and these really, really inexpensive, there's, it's probably, it's probably not good stuff that you should be drinking. Uh, I would, I would stick to, um, you know, listen, you can buy $10 bottles of Vino Verde and get some nice Pinot Noir and like stuff like that for like 10, 12 bucks. It's not going to be the best stuff, but it's, it's not going to kill you like some of the other stuff. I'm not saying Franzia is going to kill you or any of these are going to kill you, but let's just say if you want to, if you want to drink right, pay a little bit more. And if you can't afford to drink less, less frequently, um, uh, but you probably want to pony up a little bit more. Well, that doesn't help anybody's situation. <laughs> you want the truth? Uh I'm going to give you the cold, hard truth there, Julie. Well, let me ask you a question. You're always asking me freaking questions. Let me ask you. What okay. about uh, who do you like more, uh, Shohai or uh, or uh, Tatis? Oh. Who do you Showtime. who would you rather watch? Who if you're going to a who game? Who would I rather watch? You know that's that's really interesting. Uh, I I get to watch Tatis all the time because I'm here in San Diego. So not that he's old hat. I mean he's incredible. Um, I would like to see more of Shohei Otani. I think I would appreciate watching him pitch. I've actually never seen him pitch. Um, so I'd appreciate to, you know, get a chance to watch him pitch and to hit. Um, I would say, you know, the thing that makes them different, though, here, here's the difference. Fernando Tatis Jr. finds a way to win. That team finds a way. And to me, that's exciting. So He's a ball they'll player. be down by three runs in the eighth, and they will win that game. Yeah. It's it's crazy. He's he is a ball player. Like when you look at him, kid, kid's a stud. Good for him. It's a real deal. You know he's out though. Yeah. Hurt his shoulder again. Happens. Injury prone. That's the only scary part. Big contract. 14 yeah. years. Oh yeah. Injury prone. Scary. <laughs> scary. All right, well, for all this and so much more, from wine to baseball talks to messy markets, you can check out allstarcharts.com. The messiest of markets. Is this the messiest market that you can remember in recent memory? Yeah, probably. 2015 was pretty messy, and then it rolled over in August. I remember because I was moving to California at the time. I remember being in my, like, my in-law's house like as we're moving to California, and like we're short. 